Welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Deborah Levine, Executive Director of Love Heals, the Allison Gertz Foundation for AIDS Education, and the host for the series Health Watch. Founded in 1992, Love Heals' mission is to eliminate new infections through education in communities vulnerable to HIV transmission. Our organization's goal is to empower youth, their families, and allies to fight HIV and AIDS through HIV prevention and leadership development training. I also serve as the non-clinical co-chair of the New York City Department of Health's New York Nose Initiative for HIV testing. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to three dedicated New Yorkers whose work supports Love Heals efforts to empowering youth, their families, and their allies in HIV prevention and leadership development training. Part one of today's show will focus on the mission and the work of Love Heals, including a discussion around the challenges facing HIV AIDS activists and advocates in addressing prevention and sexual health education for our youth. On our second segment, we'll focus on the work of two talented artists and advocates whose art, especially the magnificent Zodiac theme, What's Your Sign, Mural Project, currently on public display on the corner of St. John's Place and Underhill Avenue in Prospect Heights section of Brooklyn. It's designed to raise awareness about the ongoing crisis of HIV and AIDS among youth in New York City, especially youth of color. For part one, here to join me in discussing the work of Love Heals and some of the challenges involved in HIV prevention for youth are Jaw Love, hey. Kareem, and Moya. <clears throat> Jaw Love is noted is a youth advocate and an AIDS activist, health educator, model, and performer. Get it. And he is also <laughs> a person living with HIV, which he contracted at the age of 15. He is one of the many faces of the National HIV Stops With Me campaign. Yes, Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Kareem Youngblood is a member of Love Hills Board of Directors and a Brooklyn native. He's a trained health educator who also happens to be an entrepreneur. He is the creator of the Bloodline Denim Jeans and is the self-taught pastry chef. So welcome. Thank you. Moya Brown has worked in the field of HIV prevention and education for over a decade. She holds a master's degree in public health from Columbia University and has specialized in HIV prevention, youth development, and reproductive health at, a vari at various community-based organizations. She currently serves as the program coordinator at the Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center. So thank you so much for being my guest today, and I'm really excited for you to be here and to be a part. So please tell our audience how you came to doing this work and really why it's so important to you, knowing Jalove, that um, you sort of have a very special sort of story um, about how you came to do what you do for us today. Um. So I've been working for Love Fields for about six, seven years. I can't believe it's been this long that I have been educating, inspiring young people and motivating them to get tested, to be informed, and um, just be a aware of what's happening in their surroundings, especially when it comes to their sexual health. Um, I particularly came to this job because me contracting HIV at such a young age, I felt like there wasn't enough out there to protect or educate young people, or influence them to know their um, sexual health or understand their bodies, period. Um, me growing up in a heterosexual Catholic Latino household as a young black gay man in the United States, when my parents were talking about sex or when sex was even talked about around me, it was um, never addressed to me being gay. It was always heterosexual sex. And so um, when I started exploring my sexuality and sexual orientation, I knew that having sex with a girl, that 
if I had sex with a girl, a protector, I could get her pregnant. And so I knew that I wasn't having sex with a girl. I wasn't going to bring nobody home pregnant. But when having sex with a guy, I didn't know the importance of condoms. I didn't know about STIs, STDs. But no, I really, I knew about them, but I didn't know that I could contract it with having sex with another man. And so when I contracted HIV at such a young age, and going through my um, trials and tribulations, when I finally had the opportunity to give back to my community, to educate young people so that they wouldn't make the same mistakes as me, I jumped at the opportunity. And um, I'm so happy to be working for Love Heals for about seven years now and educating and inspiring young people to get tested, know their status, have um, open dialogue and communication with their partners. Well, I thank you, and I'm so glad that you're here and you're a part of the Love Heals family. Um, so what are some of the, I don't know, sort of challenges that you see in doing what you do? Um, one of the challenges that I see that is that people are not addressing the mental health of, of adolescents, period. Mm -hmm. And I feel like not addressing the mental health of adolescents um, leads them to high-risk behaviors and not understanding why they're in high-risk behaviors because they're not being addressed mentally. Also, I see that um, social media takes a toll now these days, but it's not being, it's not being educated properly in school because most of the kids' education now is through social media. Um, they're intrigued more of what they see online versus what they see in a textbook or what they're being learned in school. And with social media having a play, there's so much misinformation, there's so much um, um, play on stigma, there's so much just being misinformed, period. Although the uh, um, social media is a great tool to educate, but it's also being used to continue the stigma. And I feel like young people are so entwined with their social media outlets that they're continuously getting the wrong information, which continue um, them having um, high-risk behaviors and contracting STIs and STDs, un um, unwanted pregnancy at high rates based on what they're seeing or um, experiencing. Thank you. So, just so we can clarify, STIs are? Sexually transmitted diseases and, okay. uh, well, no, STIs is sexually transmitted infections and STDs is sexually transmitted diseases. And HIV is definitely a sexually transmitted disease. disease. Yes. Is one of the modes of transmission, right? Right. Yes, ma'am. So, as we do this, um, right. so what exactly do you do? <laughs> so um, for Love Heals, I am there. I'm a health educator and also uh, a member of the Speakers Bureau as tell my personal story of living with HIV. So I go to colleges, community-based organizations, middle schools, and pretty much just tell my story, just like how I contract the HIV, what ways, um, what messaging in my story can people can take away from, and also if I am doing the education, I also do the HIV 101 and talk about um, how you can contract it, the fluids that HIV is transmitted through, method of transmission, et cetera. Wow, that's uh, a lot. And you would think that in 2015, almost closer to 40 years into this epidemic, that right. this information would be something that people would know about, that everyone would know how to protect themselves. Um. So why are we still seeing high rates of infection in our youth? I don't think that we're really addressing where it comes from. HIV, STDs, it comes from sex. Um, sex is natural. In order for any of us to be here, someone had to do something. <laughs> and we're before the super technology age. Um, I know I wasn't born like that. I was born through through sex, like everyone else. Um, so we don't talk about sex. Sex is something that old people, not old people, that you do when you're grown. So the first time a baby asks where babies come from, we lie. We say some magical bird goes fly off to God, comes back with some baby in a sack, and drop it right in front of your doorstep. We don't say babies come from mommy and daddy. Mm -hmm. 
That's the easiest way to do it. So from the gate, we're lying, and then we continue to lie, and then you don't have sex, but your body wants to have sex. So we don't treat sex as, as a health issue. We don't teach the basics about sex. We teach it as something that's for grown-ups, not something that's for healthy, not healthy, but to stay healthy. You have to know what's going on with your body. You have to know about reproductive um, rights to be healthy. To do all of that, you have to, you have to talk about it normal. You can't say this is a dingling to the point where where penis is vulgar. Mm -hmm. So like we give the cold baby names and we all hee 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 hee. But soon as someone wakes up with the erection, what happens? Mm -hmm. And that happens at 11 sometimes. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about that, mm -mm, you gotta go pee. He don't gotta pee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's what we give it to. And to add to that, I think middle school and high school is the perfect opportunity to really educate young people. Um, but unfortunately, um, in New York City and across the country, what kind of education you get, what grades you um, you receive right. it in, how many periods it is, all varies based on the school. Um, and in my experience, a lot of times, uh, the schools that have the best sex education, that it's very comprehensive, or schools that have um, a really dedicated principal, a really dedicated health teacher, PE teacher, science teacher, who really sees the the, uh, the value in, in sex ed, and so they really reach out um, to different nonprofit organizations like Love Heals. Um, but unfortunately, right. this isn't across the board. Um, it's definitely uh, required among a lot of uh, public schools, but you know, like I said, there's a lot of inconsistency. Right. Wow. Well, I agree. Yeah. No, so we have a piece of legislation that says we're supposed to do this in schools um, in a prescripted way. Ooh. And so what you're telling me pretty much is, is that we have no way of really evaluating it, no. nor do we have a better understanding of Who's doing it? Right. Definitely. Um, it is uh, required throughout middle and high school, and there's a recommended uh, curriculum, but how it's evaluated with each school um, varies. Um, so I think uh, a lot of principals have to identify whether or not they provided it, but they don't have to provide a lot of details on how long right. it was, what grades. Um, and comprehensive sex education should really be starting in elementary school, and it right. doesn't have to start with HIV transmission. It can start with good touch, bad touch, um, hygiene, things, uh, things, those kinds of topics. I mean, but the, the, but the reality of the situation is that adults feel uncomfortable talking to adolescents, young people about sex. Mm -hmm. Something that they do naturally, it's still an uncomfortable situation. I know, I know a lot of providers still don't like to talk to their um, adolescent patients about sex, sexuality. Um, so let alone to have a teacher to talk about it and feel like it's somebody's parent's job to do this. They feel like, well, it's not my job or if it is, if it is part of my curriculum, I'm not going to go too much on a topic because I don't want to be in trouble to a certain, mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Wow. And so, Moya, just um, to follow up, and thank you for including that, what, how, what is your relationship to Love Heals? Uh, I have been a health educator and elite facilitator for about five years with Live Heels. Um, I started a little bit after graduate school, um, and I've really uh, stuck with the stuck with the organization um, throughout this time because the health education programs uh, that we provide are very different than other kinds of workshops that I've seen. Um, There's always a health educator and a positive speaker um, that talks about their life experiences, right. um, and so I think that you know definitely complements the health education piece. Um, both are very important and. It it reduces a lot of stigma, um, I believe. And then you mentioned Leap for Girls? Yes. Um, so Leap for Girls is a program um, that works in all boroughs. Um, and they work with different high school um, young women after school. Um, and they meet for about three months. Um, they go through all the comprehensive sex education. Um, but they also talk about advocacy and communication skills. They develop a capstone project, I believe, at the end where they have to engage at least 500 uh, community members. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very effective program. The young people definitely bond and we get very close. Well, that's, it's exciting. And so I will share um, also that because uh, Leap for Girls, this leadership development program that we've been working on for many years, um, has led us to, to launch a young men's program. And yes. um, between the board and our facilitators really pushing the agenda. So this fall we are launching in the South Bronx a young men's initiative that will talk about reproductive health and mm -hmm. also give young men an opportunity to have a safe space to have conversations about prevention about sexual responsibility 
um, and also just to find out sort of some of those things that you talked about, learning about one's anatomy. Right. Mm -hmm. That's really important. We were in a training yesterday and we noticed that most of us can pinpoint the female's reproductive anatomy more than the male reproductive anatomy and we came to the conclusion that that's because we we're kind of we're not badged with it but where we learn that more i guess because a lot of things happen you get pregnant and i guess that makes it more important i have no idea um but that was what we realized a lot of young men don't even know what pre-ejaculatory fluid is a lot right. of young people don't even know mm -hmm. that you can get hiv from pre-ejaculatory fluid or other pregnant pregnancy sometimes from pre-ejaculatory fluid so starting with that what you call pre-cum, right? Mm -hmm. You go like that on a vagina, it's a possibility, mm -hmm. but we don't talk about that. We don't, right. we don't break that down. We don't say, you should wear a condom from start to finish. We don't say why. If you knew that you go like that and that's an exposure, you will understand why you need to put the condom on from start to finish. Mm -hmm. right. And when start starts. Right. Because right. some people starts here, mm -hmm. but right. starts there. Right. Right. I got you. And I think that there, um, I think sometimes there's a misconception about the age of a lot of young people when they become sexually active. There are definitely some uh, 11, 12, 13 year olds who are having oral sex, um, vaginal sex, anal sex, um, and not really sure about um, how to protect themselves or, or even what those terms mean, a lot of them, right. or what the pod body parts mean. Um, and so I feel a lot of times we wait until a young person is already um, having different kinds of um, feelings and sexual behaviors and relationships and, and opportunities for, to, for communication. Um, and we really don't want to miss the boat, I guess. Right. I think that's very important. Like I always see age as a, a, a barrier um, because first we have the ones that we want to protect and then we have the protectors. The protectors mm -hmm. went through heck and back, right? Mm -hmm. They seen HIV almost wipe out all of their friends. Mm -hmm. They seen the rise of every disease. They seen this, so they're like, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. But they don't remember when they were 16. They don't remember when they were 12, when they first lost their virginity. Oh, I think they remember. But they, they <laughs> act like, they act like they forgot. They act That's like right. that doesn't happen. They act like, okay, if you, you're very lucky if you go, you find a high school sweetheart, you go off to college, y'all stay together, you get married, you lose your virginity on the honeymoon, you are one in a million, and then we want to take the one in a million and make it a dime a dozen. The same, it, it doesn't happen like that. Right. It's, it's hard for that. Right. How many friends do you have that graduated, waited till they were married, started having sex after then, and then had kids? How many people can say that we know more people that did that versus starting sex at 13 you or have even a younger. point here. I was just reading a study the other day that said that 47% of New York City high school students have actually already engaged in some sort of sexual behavior. Um, so that just sort of raises the whole conversation about what we do know, and that is when we teach young people about reproductive health and about sexual health, and when we talk about HIV prevention, one of the things that was very clear and keeps coming up in the studies is that when we talk to young people in this way in an honest, open environment, it does not encourage them to have sex. It actually mm -hmm. prolongs them right. from engaging in sexual behavior. And for those that do engage, they go in with a better understanding of mm -hmm. what's at risk, the importance of using barriers, right whether that's a condom, a dental dam, or whatever they're using at that point. And also to be able to have a conversation with the person that they're engaging with. Um, so that makes, that makes absolutely so much sense because I mean, I, I, the reason why I engaged in sex at such a young age because it wasn't being taught at home. I had so much curiosity, um, especially having sex with another guy. Um, in school, they were teaching me all the things that I didn't want to know, and so I felt like a, I wanted to do it. B, I wanted to be popular for doing it. And C, I wanted to know so I can educate my friends that were also having the same feelings as myself. And so, you know, so a lot of things definitely could have been prevented had I been properly educated or properly informed or even empowered mm -hmm. to a certain extent. And so um, it makes so much sense to me. So I want to move the conversation just a little bit. Um, we know that when we talk about reproductive health, sexual health justice, HIV prevention, some of the work that Love Heals 
really embodies and instills by through the Speakers Bureau, through our Leap uh, for Girls, this new program for young men, the Youth Advisory Council that we're starting, is addressing stigma. It's sort of the big S word in the room that, you know, we banter around with. But we know that stigma is alive and well. It's mm -hmm. 2015. We're almost 40 years into this epidemic. And, you know, I dare to say that I've been doing this work all of my professional life. And stigma is still one of the biggest barriers. Can you talk to us a little bit about how the work, whether it's through you sitting on the board and being a Speakers uh, Bureau member, or through the work through LEAP, or just being a part of an organization that's willing to use the S word and really figure out some strategies for addressing it. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, so stigma. I, I can talk about the levels of stigma that I experienced as being uh, a young black gay man, HIV positive gay black man in America, I mean, and having to walk out the door and knowing that I have these labels, I have to face some of these discrimination based on my, um, based on the categories I fall underneath. But stigma in itself, when it comes to HIV and AIDS, that disease had dehumanized an individual. And based on that, it's why um, there's such high level of stigma when it comes to somebody who's HIV positive because, you know, it, you still have those images back in the days. Although with the high level of education, people still go back to the, the, the beginning of the epidemic and that, you know, I couldn't get close to this person or this person was dying or, you know, I don't want to get close to this person or love this person because they may just die. And so um, the whole dehumanizing of a person based on this disease, we still haven't even got over that hurdle. Mm. I, I agree with that. I see stigma as uh, an outcome of fear. Um, I think that because you are afraid, and then what are you afraid of? If it's HIV, the first thing you're afraid of is death, right? Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to die. I don't know why it has to be shameful for someone to be HIV positive, um, especially when they just had sex or whatever they were doing, intravenous drug use. I don't say that's right, but some people do what some people do, and you don't judge, you help them go the right way. Um, so the stigma is very, 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 very hard to break. Um, and I remember in a presentation that I was in, um, one of the health educators were going, not health educator, one of the um, positive speakers, excuse me, was going through a list mm -hmm. of the STDs they had. Mm -hmm. And the list to some people is long. One li one on a list could be long, but when you have two or three, mm -hmm. they're like, oh my gosh. And the kids was like, ugh, running away. And some of the kids ask, why is she telling us this? Is she proud that she had syphilis or gonorrhea mm -hmm. and chlamydia? No, she's proud that she's alive. She's proud that she made it through all of that. And mm -hmm. still on top, she's proud to stand in front of you and devote something so, so shameful mm -hmm. to you so you don't have to deal with it. So we address stigma by by embracing it. I guess you have to you have to give you have to sometimes you give of yourself as just a health educator. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I tell my whole life story. I tell right. that I was sexually abused, that I was this, that I went through that. I don't have to do that just to tell you how to put on a condom. Right. Right. But I have to do that to connect with you. Right. I have to do that right. so that you know that I'm just like you. Mm -hmm. And right. she also mentioned that her daughter was born with crack in her system and they was like, ah, crack baby. My mother was a crack addict. I wasn't a crack, a crack baby, but I jumped to the fence. I was a crack baby. Mm -hmm. Why? Right. Because I'm addressing that stigma, and this is what a crack baby looks like. Mm -hmm. And maybe you were, too, because in our community, a lot of our grandparents are raising us because our mothers and our fathers are out on drugs. Right. Or incarcerated. Or incarcerated. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and so stigma, so stigma is a learned behavior. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a learned behavior. And so we, as Love Heals um, speakers, we go in and you know what, sort of, uh, I could say, um, dissect people beliefs on um, a group, uh, group of individuals or the disease itself. And that's how we're able to combat that because it's like, here's what you was taught. Here's what's actually the fact is, and then bring it back. If this person's still a human at the end of the day, you know what I'm saying? That could be your brother, your mother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle. You shouldn't treat them different based on the fact that they um, have this illness. So as we're 
beginning to come to an end. Um, tell me what a good ally in HIV prevention. When the people in the community are out there watching this show, they're not connected to a community-based organization. They don't necessarily do this work, but they are a concerned citizen. They do belong to the Black Association. They may be an Eastern Star. They may belong to a sorority or a fraternity. What can they do to become better allies in this work? Give me three things apiece. Be more educated. Um, know about a lot of the topics that we've talked about today and be comfortable talking um, to talking about them with your own family, your friends, uh, children, grandparents, um, because I think that's a big part of the stigma issue we were talking about. Right. One, um, I would say, call Love Hills. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, we have the tools necessary to give all the information. Um, we get tested. Get tested. Yes. Know your HIV status. You know, I feel like once you know your status, that leads to um, you having a conversation and also you learning more and having education. And then once you learn more about the disease, you will really know that your perception on it based on your education would change. Mm. Uh, I agree with all those. I say be honest and not just your honesty, but but honest to the whole world. Not just what you did, but what happens in the world. Um, you can't just go by what happened in your life. You have to open up a little bit. Um, and then what I, what I do all the time is act as an elevator. If someone's in the basement and you want them to go to the 10th floor, you don't go to five and be like, all right, walk up these stairs, I'll be right here, girl. No, you go all the way down to the lower level and then you bring them up floor by floor by floor by floor. And then you get them on the roof and you say, all right, build. And then they build some more, and then they take somebody up, and we keep getting higher and higher and higher. Well, Can it I sounds to me like um, we still got a lot of work to do, but yes. I really, really want to say to you, um, it's been a true honor and a privilege, and I commend you all for being able to do this work and to stand in front of our community sometimes very much Right. bearing your complete soul. Um, so once again, my thanks to you, Jalov, Thank Kareem, you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting Moya, us. for being a guest today. Uh, see you back at the office, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yes, with some chicken. <laughs> with some chicken. Yes. And I would like you to stay with us and hold on for part two of today's programming. I'm especially excited about this segment because it gives me the opportunity to talk about what's your sign, The Mural Project, an exciting and innovative art exhibit which pays tribute to the life and work of the late a activist Ali Gertz and those and whose purpose was to really raise awareness about HIV and the ongoing crisis in New York City's youth, especially youth of color. The New York City State Department of Health released data indicating that in 2013, black and Latinos comprised 85% of the new HIV diagnosis among 12 to 24-year-olds and 91% of new AIDS diagnosis in New York City data, which highlighted the extent of the devastating HIV crisis affecting communities of color. So join me today. Um, are my, I'm sorry, so give us a moment and we will stop and take a commercial break and we'll be right back. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to part two to, of today's program. I'm especially excited about this segment because it gives me the opportunity to talk about the What's Your Sign mural project, an exciting and innovative art exhibit which pays tribute to the life and work of the late AIDS activist, Ali Gertz, and whose purpose is to raise awareness about the ongoing crisis of HIV and AIDS among New York City youth, especially youth of color. The New York State Department of Health released data indicating that in 2013, Black and Latinos comprised 85% of all new HIV diagnosis among 12 to 24-year-olds. 91% of all new AIDS diagnosis in New York City data highlights the extent of the devastating HIV-AIDS crisis 
affecting communities of color. Join me today are my guests, Jeff Beeler and Jeff Enriquez. Jeff Beeler is the co-curator of the What's Your Sign mural project, along with his fellow co-curator, Frank Velez, who unfortunately is unable to join us today. Mr. Beeler, a resident of Prospect Heights, Brooklyn, has been living with HIV for 30 years. He's a graduate of the Alpha Workshop Studio School, founded in 1995, to provide industrial-specific training and employment in the decorative arts to men and women living with HIV. He has over 25 years of experience as an interior direct designer, prop stylist, and a photographer of graffiti. Jeff Enriquez is a native of Massachusetts and is a graduate of the Bradford College where he studied art with a concentration in painting. He's an art instructor and he does art exhibits such as the one we're discussing today and freelance work. Thank you for being my guest today. Thank so, you for having us. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. Jeff, tell our viewers how you and Frankie conceptualized this project. Um, well, um, I've curated two previous walls and one of them was with Danielle, so we kind of knew about each other in the neighborhood, but um, there was a barricade that was up on St. John's in Washington where uh, I had been eyeing for a long time. And I just thought it would be perfect for some sort of a mural project. So I approached Frankie and I said, I've always wanted to do a Zodiac theme mall. And he said, well, let's put a list of people together. So we looked at a lot of artwork and said, this person would work with this person. And um, when all of that was, uh, put together, that's when I called you and, or he said, let's work with a nonprofit. And that's when um, I did my research and, and, and I, you accepted my call. And you said, <laughs> we've had, never had anything like this before. So um, yeah, so it, that's how it all kind of came together. But um, I, I have, you know, uh, it meant a lot to me for, to be a, associated with you, with your project, because it's about um, HIV awareness and education. Mm -hmm. Um, I was diagnosed at the age of 22, and I'm 51 now, um, and uh, it was from a clinic worker who called me on the phone and said, Positivo, you have a year to live. So, uh, obviously devastated, and back in the 80s there wasn't the education or, you know, we, we really didn't know. So, um, a lot of my friends did not make, make the, um, the disease, and, uh, but I'm here today and I'm undetectable and healthy. So. Um, Frankie is an established curator, and he has been since 2007. So, um, and this uh, has really been a journey. You know, he, when he put the, our, our website up on Facebook, um, he said, F follow us on a journey, and it has been. Uh, we have 16 incredible artists that all have kind of changed my life and given me strength to do for future projects. Well, that's great, and I thank you for sharing your story with us. And My pleasure. I thank you for doing your research and finding Love Heals, because for us it has been a fabulous journey. Um, just from our first initial sort of conversation about how art could really begin to open the doors sure. for communication around talking about things as critical as sex and sexuality and how one goes about learning about HIV and preventing one from becoming infected. Right. So I really do applaud you and thank you for being courageous enough to continue to follow your dream in this work. And I'm really excited that you're here with us today. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be here. It's um, This gentleman has been my rock and a supporter of uh, everything that what we've all gone through over the last three months. Too so, kind. Um, Too kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really glad. And I'm sorry that Frankie couldn't join us. Um, unfortunately, he's had a death in his family. Yes. But we extend our wishes yep. and our prayers to him and his loved ones in this time of need. So know that we're thinking about yes, you. Yes, Frankie. That's right. Um, and that we're here to represent the work that you do. Indeed. So, um, I just want to move the conversation along just a little bit. Sure. 
Um, Jeff, um, tell me a little bit about um, you are among 16 renowned street artists who have donated their time and talents uh, to this project. Why is this work so important to you? Well, <clears throat> the funny thing is a lot of the street artists that were that participated are, as you said, they're known. And what was exciting to me is nobody really knew who I was, which made it interesting to me. I don't like really being known. I like to be the anonymous guy. Mm -hmm. I, I did a show a couple of years ago at, uh, at Dorian Gray, mm -hmm. and I got to show with um, Banksy, mm -hmm. Shepard Ferry, mm. a, a, a pile of other humongous names. I knew who everybody was. Oh, and Keith Haring was on the wall too. Nobody knew who I was, and that's exactly how I liked it, because I like to, I've always been like the underdog, the guy mm -hmm. in the back, the guy that nobody knows who he is, and that's kind of where I prefer to be a lot of the time. And so with this project, again, nobody, most people didn't know who I was, but, uh, but Frankie knows my work very well. So he said, all right, Jeff, you're up. So I said, okay, let's do it. It, 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 was about, it was about a 10 second conversation. And he asked me to step in and, and do some work. And, and that was it. And he, I'd done some projects with him before, a couple of shows with him before. And you know, it's, impo it was imp it's important to me because I don't have, like there's, there's stuff that runs through my family as well. Mm -hmm. And so I know what it's like to watch someone deteriorate from mm -hmm. an illness. So in the same vein, I'm able to empathize a great deal with people who have these kinds of things that happen to them in their families, to them personally, and so close to me as well. Mm -hmm. So plus, it's a, it's a phenomenal cause. You really shouldn't say no to something like this when someone offers it to you, you know? Um, and so, you know, like I said, it's, it's a pretty easy thing to say yes to. And there are a lot of other reasons why I'm very glad that I did it. Well, we're glad that you accepted the call and um, decided to step up. So which Zodiac or which panel are you doing? Um, it's funny. I didn't do a Zodiac sign. I painted Allison's portrait hmm. herself. Now, she is a Pisces, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. I'm also a Pisces. Mm. I mean, everybody knows that the Pisces is the best sign on the Zodiac. It, it's okay. Um, okay, well, Alberto, no, Joseph, and I would disagree with that. But, I, I would uh, yeah. expect you to, and that's okay. But, go Aries. But, you know, it's, I'll, I'll let it, I'll let it, I'll let it go. Give a shout-out to the Sages of the universe. Yeah, this is it's true. Okay. So, yeah, but I'm a Pisces, and then Allison is a Pisces, of course. And uh, so there was, a, you know, a bit, of, a bit of a connection there, but uh, it, the whole thing was just a... a, a, a a great experience, man. People walking up, kids especially. When the, when the kids walk up and they, and they watch you do what you do, I immediately would stop, invite, invite the kids mm -hmm. to come in, give, give them the spray can or the brush and say, hey, here, do a little of this. And it only takes a second to inspire something in a child, especially in a child. Absolutely. Where if, if, they, if they can, because they're, they're tactile. Mm -hmm. They process things two ways with their sense of touch and with their emotions. Mm -hmm. And so if you can just sort of gear that to something that's really bright and positive for them, it'll stick. And then you will have kids walking away saying things like, mommy, I want to be an artist. That's, when I, that's, that's a success to me. Mm -hmm. When I can you know, get into a child's mind and, 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 and get him or her to really get excited about something. And it's not difficult. And you really have to just be humble. Humble yourself and just let the, let the universe just kind of gently push you along. Guide you in the process. That's right. Well, and the, I'm sorry, the involvement Ooh. of the neighborhood has, you know, that's what I've always wanted, the interaction of life's street art. It really brought everybody together. You yeah. know, as you know, every time we were out at the wall, it just changed people, and the conversation is now out there. So. So I should tell you that, you know, we initially planned to do this launch and this sort of dedication um, the weekend of the hurricane here in right. New York that <laughs> yeah. missed us, uh -huh. and we were so fortunate of that. But I have to tell you the thing that I found most incredible is that we moved it to Columbus Day weekend, and I was really sort of very concerned, like, 
where the artist's going to be able to come because all of these are 16 artists are well established, yes. have other projects that they're working on. And the thing that I found most um, sort of it, invigorating was the fact that all day for three days the community was coming and sharing their stories about family members who were positive, who may have passed on, um, struggling with the whole question around sex and sexuality and their identity and being able to figure out, you know, can I come out? Can I tell my story? Right. And we heard so many compelling stories about people who felt like they could go home because they saw themselves in these murals. That's true. That yeah. they could figure out a way to begin to have the conversations and it was absolutely mind-blowing. So I really want to thank you for the opportunity sure. in sharing that. Can you tell us a little more about who some of the artists are? Yes. Uh, well, I'll go down the list and excuse me, but mm -hmm. um, Albertus Joseph did um, Aries. Uh, Taurus is Raquel uh, and, and Echenique. Uh, Gemini is Mizuki. Uh, Cancer is Zamad. Leo was um, um, Misfit and Stray, which is Justin Winslow and Carmelo Farrell. Virgo was Rob Platter. Libra uh, uh, is Jill Foligno. Scorpio is Fumero. Sagittarius is Batter Israel, your sign. Yes. Um, Capricorn was You Are New York, and that's uh, Ski and 2SA. Mm -hmm. uh, Aquarius was Cyanide. And then the lovely Danielle Mestrion did um, uh, Pisces. And then we have Cole Walnuts, who did a beautiful yes. mural for Love Heals. Yes. I mean, it's really a stunning piece. So, but all of these artists are, I think, completely different in their style and, and their approach, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it, daily people come up to me and thank uh, us for what we did for them. The conversation is still going on. Unfortunately, there is some stigma. You know, I have a lot of friends who've been positive and they're survivors, but they can't come out due to their employers or embarrassment with the families. So um, hopefully we can change that, you know, while well, this, this project keeps going on. I think so. I think that um, just in the short period of time that I've been out there, as the murals have been taking shape, um, because we should note that they're eight foot by eight foot. Yes, yes. Um, just the conversations around, I didn't know. I didn't know HIV still was a plague for young people here in New York City. Yes. I had no idea that young people were being impacted in this way. Um, and I think the amazing part of this was just how these 16 artists engaged in the community, stopped and talked, took pictures. Sure. Um, and so I know um, that October 31st, um, Saturday, from 10 to 1, at 314 St. John's Place in Underhill Avenue in Brooklyn, New York, we will be having a dedication where we will be dedicating the murals to the community and sort of acknowledging the stats around HIV and youth in New York City. Uh, we'll be fortunate enough that uh, Carol Gertz, Allison's mom, is coming to join us Great. that day. No pressure at all. Yeah. <laughs> right. She pressure is all. so excited. She doesn't even want to see the mural until she's there. She's so excited. And then we're going to have a host of elected officials because what we really want to do is help them make the connection. Great. That art can connect to bigger conversations sure. and that HIV prevention is just that. It's about having a conversation because when we do know is, is that the more knowledge we share, the better we do. And that we owe young people the opportunity for a safe place to have a conversation. Right to talk about their sexual orientation, but to also give them strategies on how not to become HIV positive. And if you are positive, it's not always a death sentence. You a know? lot of, you know, right. there are people that thought they were gonna die and they're still around. Yeah, you and know? you know, just the fact that you're present, Jeff, is a humongous deal. It's a <laughs> really big deal. Not to mention the fact that you're 51 and no gray hair on your head. <laughs> I, think, I think that's, Fantastic too. I would love to. I would love to trade to, to trade that. 
because well, <laughs> I've, I've got way, way too much. Yeah. So, but this, you know, this project, as you know, had many moving parts, and um, if it wasn't for Philip Hilton and his support, he has been my rock as well. I mean, I hate to single out any of these people because I've had many long conversations with Fumero and Alberta and Jeff and Jill, whoever was there to support, mm -hmm. you know, let's get through this. And including George Diaz, who is the contractor side of all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's he the guy behind the curtain. Yeah. If, they, if George wasn't involved, I'm going to tell you right now, the, there wouldn't be any walls. Right. right. There wouldn't be this is true. Lumber, there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any logistical, anything to work with, because all of that came together due to, you know, George. And, and, his, and his, you know, his dedication to the project. Right, and even my brother came up. He took a week off from North Carolina out of his own business as a contractor to help build these panels. So there's many. Um, we're very grateful to that. But there's also another sort of unsung hero in this process who's been documenting from start to yes, finish. Yes, Mr. James Weber, an incredible, an incredible oh, photographer. He Guys gave this thing legs. I mean, it could have just been some little wall, but if it wasn't for his idea of doing the color bombing and, and donating his studio and his time to take all these pictures. You know, his, his, photo, his color bomb idea mm -hmm. is what inspired me to do her portrait the way that I did it. And it, it, it all just sort of clicked. And then I think there was, there was a woman in the, in, the, in, the, in the group of folks that came every day to watch his paint who said, mm -hmm. uh, oh, Jeff brought Allison into 2015 because right. I did the whole color bomb mm -hmm. thing ar ar around her. Right. And then I even added the color in front of her so mm -hmm. that she's like in, you know, in it. Right. You know what I mean? So that, that, that kind of was, it, his, his work inspired me for this, for this whole thing. When, when, when I saw the photos right. and the stills and the, and the videos, and there was a little clip that you made, right. that thing was bananas. I, I, I love what, looking at that thing. I wish it to everybody. It was like the beginning of like this epic film it or was, something. Mm -hmm. It was you making know? grown men cry. Yeah, um, I, was, I took a film workshop this summer with Stephen Winter, and I put together this little trailer that just kind of... Oh, know, it was awesome. It was Definitely. Awesome. Yes. But... Um, there's something yeah, about... And that, I'm, what? I was going to say there's something about slow violins creeping into the scene <laughs> that really sort of like, you know, grab you. And I'm, and I'm, look, I'm looking at the clip and I'm like, yo, is, is this for like, is this the Star Wars trailer? Is this <laughs> like, you know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yes. And you can find that on our Facebook page. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, for sure, it's up there and it is a fabulous piece of work. So that sort of leads me to this next question is, how is it that, um, how does art really play a role in raising awareness around HIV and other important issues for that Can matter. I say this one? Yes, please do. What I tell people, and this, is, this was particularly noticeable because we had a lot of artists of color working on this project, mm -hmm. which gets me excited by default. And the reason is, especially with Latino artists, and I've told this to people before, whether we realize it or not, Latino artists are political artists. We are political rebels. Well, why is that? Because every Latino country in the Caribbean and in South America are countries that have suffered a great deal of political repression, mm -hmm. expressive repression. There were points where you could never speak against the government in Cuba, Santo Domingo as well, in Argentina, Chile. Those, those countries were very quick to silence a subversive voice. Mm -hmm. Now, you couldn't walk down the street and preach anything. You could only do it with subliminal images mm -hmm. or with subversive images. A lot of times that uh, only small groups of people understood what they meant. So as a Latino artist myself, I take it very seriously when I consider what kind of artist I am. Mm -hmm. And with all of us together, the energy created, whether they acknowledge that philosophy or not, it's, it's important, for me at least, to acknowledge that and keep that in my, my, my thought process because we owe it to our communities, to our cultures, and to our own personal identities to work at the highest level possible if we're gonna be seen or if we're gonna communicate something important to other people, to other cultures, races, 
ethnicities, whatever you want to call it. And so, you know, for, for me, it was, it was particularly a big honor to be asked to, to do this project. Because it, it's, it's easy to just be like, nah, you know, I, I got other stuff to do. Mm -hmm. But m money notwithstanding, it's, it's really important to just continue to work so that other people will watch what you do, whether they like your work or they don't like your work, but to see that you are giving back to your community and really playing a role in elevating people's mentality, elevating their self-esteem, showing them what they can actually do, showing them what you can do, showing them that there's, there's more to just what the media transmits to you for your own culture. A lot of what we know is transmitted through media. 90% mm -hmm. of our own culture is transmitted through media. We, we've always got our face into a screen. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, yeah. we, we don't have as many conversations like we used to. We, we, right. we don't interact with people the same way. And you know, as an artist, I feel personally responsible for making people stop and look at something uh, and, and then having a conversation about it. And Latino artists are, are very good with that. Yes, um, definitely. So it's a, it's a responsibility. Mm -hmm. It I is, think. especially for my community, because that is my backyard. And I think Philip had said it at one point. He said, this guy could have just kept going and minded his own business. He didn't have mm -hmm. to come out on television. He didn't have to say anything. And I didn't do it because I wanted sympathy or, you know, it was a passion of mine. Because I know the power of how those walls get people talking, what, what, no matter what it was. The wall I worked on with Danielle and Mears and Enemy, um, that was the first thing that made me realize. And that wasn't even an event. That was just, you know, just a, a bunch of people, a process of people, and it got, that thing got exposure, you know. So what's next for the murals after the dedication? Well, we're looking and uh, for a gallery space so we can have an auction. And mm -hmm. then when uh, even international silent on auction. Mm -hmm. So when the sale, the portion of the proceeds will go to Love Heals, and um, hopefully we can take this into other neighborhoods that are affected even, Definitely. you know, Prospect Heights isn't really the, the typical um, area that has a lot of, you know, high infection rates. So if we took this to maybe the Bronx or here in East Harlem or wherever, you know, we'd, we'd like gotcha. to do that. Well, we appreciate it. So we're looking to do that hopefully by the middle to the end of November, November to get yes. into an art gallery. Yeah, actually, um, um, Ski from your New York, mm -hmm. um, I spoke to him last night. He and um, 2SA, they, they, they started out selling their artwork in 2007 on the streets of Soho. Now mm -hmm. they're represented by three major galleries, one in Dallas, one in London, and one here in New York. Wow. So he has a meeting with somebody today to hopefully help us get some sort of a space locked down. So. Nice. That's fabulous. Yeah, and I'd like to give a shout out to Cyanide who, you know, helped yes. us. He and Eric Gore loaned us their um, it's warehouse space when the yes. when the hurricane uh, put a little damper on our plans. Mm -hmm. So um, it, there are just there are so many people involved, including um, I, can, I mean Cheryl's who hosted our party. Right. You know, everybody's been so supportive of this yeah. whole process. Absolutely. So I just want to say thank you both. I thank you just doesn't seem to be <laughs> enough. Um, you are now part of the Love Hills family. You can't run away from us because we've got our, we're latched in, you know. I know, Mr. Philip Hilton said that. He's got me to the very, the bitter end. So. The very, very bitter end. But I really do want to thank you for your commitment, your focus, your dedication, and your ability to open doors for young people to begin to have conversations and to give parents an opportunity to have the hardcore conversation. Right. So I just really want to encourage people to come out on October 31st, Saturday, um, to make sure that you are there with us at 314 St. John's Place and Underhill Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. Um, you'll be able to take pictures with right. the artists. We're asking people to do selfies, and the hashtag is What's your sign, mural project, and tell us why HIV prevention is so critical. Um, we hope that 
you and our viewers find today's topic to be informative. For information about the mission and the work of Love Heals, the Allison Gertz Foundation for AIDS Education, please visit our website at www.loveheals.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and on behalf of Love Heals, I express my sincerest thanks to Manhattan Neighborhood Network, whose programming enriches all of our lives by presenting us with information that addresses critical issues that affect us as New Yorkers. We hope that you've enjoyed today's program and will tell your family, friends, and neighbors about this series. I'm your host, Deborah Levine. Thank you for watching. I'll see you soon right here on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All right.